this is literally a, um, a potential life-saving resource. We might be able to uh, prevent, you know, the uh, annihilation of the future by greenhouse gas emissions. Now we have this tool. So I wanted to sort of stress how crucially important it is to have this. And the reason, of course, is what's happening to our atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations and what's happening to increasing emissions. That's what makes this uh, trace a resource so vitally important. another edition of the Climate Emergency Forum. I'm your host, Regina, and I'm happy that you've decided to join us today. We are going to be discussing a fascinating new website that I know that you're going to love to hear about. Our show for today, Climate Trace, Chasing the Emitters. So this is really, really exciting. Climate Trace is a, an exciting new website. And it details a database of all human-caused emissions from all major sources, power plants, refineries, rice cultivation, cement production, shipping, you name it. It's an incredibly wonderful thing because until now, corporations have been able to play dumb and pretend that they don't know, there's just simply no way to quantify the amount of emissions that, that they're producing, much less what they are. Are they CO2? Are they methane? A few cops ago, I believe this was in Madrid, uh, I went to a display. They have all these various little displays where you can learn about various ways that organizations are trying to help with our climate crisis. And one of the booths that I went to, I have to admit, I was really enthralled because it was one of those, you know, you put the goggles on and you're in artificial wherever. It, it's, it was like a video game, what it was. And so they were demonstrating this, this new technology where people could go to refineries and such and see where methane was leaking. They could trace these methane links and close the gaps, which I think is important and good but the problem is you're, you know, you're relying on Exxon or Shell or Gulf to say, oh, yeah, we do have major uh, CO2 or methane emissions happening here. You know, I think it's probably, even though they may say that they are a green company and things like that, it's probably not so good to have the fox guarding the hen house, right? This website is just incredibly fantastic because... They use AI in order to determine where these leakages are happening and who, in fact, is responsible for these leakages and what they are comprised of. It's incredible that they use satellites. I was even able, and you will be too, once you discover this website, to get so granular as to see Newark Airport, what does their emissions look like, and then compare it to some of these tiny countries or towns around the world. The difference is really incredible. So this is going to be sort of like a great way to catch people, or we can be really positive and say it's a great way to help industries be more green. Let's look at it that way, right? So what I found fascinating, they have different ways of presenting the data. And I looked at the top 10 places of, of the greatest emissions in the world. And what I found was, of course, no surprise, a lot of them were in the United States. Number one was from uh, the Permian area in the southwestern part of the United States. I believe that comprises Texas, my home state, where I was from. Three of them are United States. Three are from Canada. Three from Russia. So if you want to know who the guilty parties are, there you go. And then you can take it from these various regions. And as I said, see exactly where these leakages are happening. And listen, we're not going to reach 1.5. We've discussed that a lot on this program. And you, our followers, know that as well. 
But I think every little bit that we can do has to just help. It's very important that we pinpoint who these emitters are and help them to stop doing what they're doing because it's affecting all of our health and the help of our one beautiful planet. And I'm really excited to hear what you have to say, Peter. I know you've got so many incredible charts and you've been looking at these methane emissions and CO2 emissions for many, many years now. So please tell us, what did you find from this website? Thanks, Regina. Yeah, it's, um, uh, you're not kidding. It's an amazing and it's an astounding website. And yeah, I, I do monitor and keep close watch on on the emissions. And of course, this is this is a huge facility. This is literally um, a potential life saving resource. We might be able to uh, prevent, you know, the uh, annihilation of the future by greenhouse gas emissions. Now we have this tool. So I wanted to sort of stress how crucially important it is to have this. And the reason, of course, is what's happening to our atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations and what's happening to increasing emissions. That's what makes this uh, trace resource so vitally important. So I just want to mention quickly that all three of our greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, which, by the way, are each covered by the trace uh, resource, by the trace engine, if you want. You can look at each one individually. Each one is accelerating. CO2 is now 420 parts per million. It's increased over 50% now. Methane is soaring up, as you know, with a wetland feedback on an explosive uh, increase. And that's at 1,920 parts per billion. So that's a 166% increase. So uh, these numbers are absolutely crazy. They are crazy. They're totally insane as to our future. So uh, emissions, yeah. So emissions are going up. They're absolutely huge. You know, uh, um, I, I think it's almost only Al Gore that I can remember sort of, you know, talking about how vast these emissions are every year. And he has his uh, famous quote of we're using the atmosphere like a sewer, which is uh, pretty correct. CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions have increased 66% since 1990. We had this dip with COVID in which we're all excited that maybe um, that this had proved that we, uh, we could drop emissions and uh, not in any massive sacrifice. But of course, what happened was the governments gave $150 billion of our taxpayer money to the uh, sources that we can track down with trace of the emissions and they bounce right back up again. And so we are on a rapidly increasing trajectory of global CO2 emissions. That's what I call a suicide scenario because it is. Um, we can get on trace, you can do CO2, you can do methane, you can do nitrous oxide, and you can do them all together because there's one for CO2E. So you can get CO2 equivalent, which mixes them all together on trace and see where that's coming from. CO2 equivalent, our emissions are, again, accelerating. They're at 55 or 56 billion tons every year. And it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy and insane. So getting to the trace. So uh, you can do fossil fuel operations in the world. And you can do agriculture, for example, in the world. And uh, fossil fuel operations, they calculate at 19 to 20 billion tons of CO2e, because fossil fuels actually emit all three greenhouse gases. They emit a lot of CO2 that everybody knows about. Now we know they emit a lot of methane as the natural gas industry is expanding, and natural gas being mainly methane, it leaks, of course. The other big, big source, of course, is agriculture and food production. On agriculture, they get 13 to 14 billion tons of CO2e every year. So that's an illustration of what you can do. I was mentioning to Paul just be before the show because many of us have been frustrated and interested for many years on the way the IPCC treats methane. And um, uh, what it does is it defers methane over 100 years, which is absolutely ridiculous, uh, absolutely not scientific. And methane lasts in the atmosphere about 10 or 12 years. But it's being constantly emitted every second. So um, uh, we're trying to persuade the scientists to go on to the IPCC alternative, which is 20 years. And Trace um, shows us the difference, absolutely massive, on the CO2E over a 100-year time frame. 
deferring it over 100 years, the amount that they get being emitted every year is 55.79. That goes up to 80 if they use the correct global warming potential over a 20 year period. It's a huge difference. And I'll just repeat once here, you're absolutely right. The EPA did a recent checkup on uh, fugitive emissions in the state somewhere, and uh, the emissions came out to double what was being reported um, by the producers, by the corporations. Yeah. Thank you so much for mentioning that fugitive emissions. Well, you know what? We need to catch those fugitives. They're running loose and running wild, and we can't allow that. Uh, I really appreciate your discussion on methane. I love the fact that we can scroll through various sectors. So agriculture is responsible for 10% of emissions. And of that 10%, over 5% five, well, 5 is from what they call enteric fermentation. What does that mean when cows pass gas? Let's just put it that way. I mean, for God's sakes, we're ruining the planet because of the indigestion of cows. Why do we have to keep eating these animals? It's ridiculous. Another 2.7 billion tons or another 1% added on top of that is to manage their manure. Talk about using our planet as a sewer. And I'm not blaming the cows. They're captured in this whole system that we have going that just absolutely has to end. Paul, what did you find from this website? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this, this website is very much needed and it's very timely that we're getting it because if we wait much longer, the emissions from the ocean and atmosphere and the tundra, the emissions from the earth will very soon start to dwarf anthropogenic or human emissions. And then we're in great trouble of going into sort of climate runaway. The website is extremely important because metrics are very important. We need to quantify the emissions and the emitters, which is what this site is doing, so that nobody can hide anymore. Self-regulation in the industry does not work. There's lots of gaming of the system. There's lots of cheating. The companies need to be held to account. We can set targets um, for on a very granular scale drill in on certain companies and set targets for them. And we can see if their compliance is occurring, not trusting what they say, but what we measure the clouds of greenhouse gases coming from their individual sites. And then we can um, inflict heavy penalties on non-conformance. So we need to measure, document, and then we can force companies to reduce their emissions, even shame them if, publicly if they haven't. And it's, it's actually a win-win for the companies too, because company um, transporting natural gas, if they have a leak in their pipeline, they're losing money. It's like dollars going out of the holes of their pipeline. So by telling them, that, you know, just get, get a person out there with a wrench, you know, a lot of these solutions are very simple and can have a huge impact on reducing emissions. And the idea of using AI is very important. It allows you to um, recognize patterns of emissions and, uh, you know, once the AI, it'll, it'll let, it just saves you a lot of time and cost in doing the assessments. Now, what I'd like to see, I mentioned that, well, I like how they, they divide things into sectors, but, you know, we know that some of the emissions that have slipped through the gaps in the past involve those from air travel, also ship travel, commercial shipping, but also the military. The military is often gets away scot-free with things, but now with satellite monitoring of emissions, we know that where the military bases are, we can just monitor emissions from these bases, from training exercises, et cetera, you know, and really pin down numbers on the military so that nobody really gets away scot-free. Now, the CO2 equivalent uh, numbers are very important. And uh, as Peter pointed out, you know, it should be on a 20-year scale. I mean, the, the 100 years, it's really crazy how that's traditionally been how um, it's been discussed in the past. And, uh, you know, in Hansen's paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline, he talked about CO2 equivalent, where you incorporate the global warming potentials of, of methane and nitrous oxide and the long-lived hydrocarbons, et cetera, the, the trace gases that affect greenhouse effects. 
And uh, we've already, we're, we're already a point where we're double CO2 if you look at the equivalent CO2 equivalent as opposed to just CO2. So, but we're nowhere near an equilibrium. There's a lot big lag in the system. We're getting, we've got a lot of warming already in the pipeline, you know, as Hansen has discussed often. The other thing I'd like to see, I'd like to see this expanded to aerosols and particulates, this type of analysis. I think they should incorporate that because if aer aerosols are very important, we're seeing right now spikes in ocean temperatures, both in the Pacific and Atlantic. And many people are starting to attribute these to a reduction of sulfates that are emitted from the shipping industry, for example. You know, with tighter regulations that the International Maritime Organization put on ship fuels in 2015, we're seeing a lot less um, aerosols in the ship trails that the sulfates that actually cause some shielding of sunlight and therefore reducing them causes causes warming and temperature spikes. So I think it's very important that we expand this to cover aerosols, but also to cover these emissions from the earth systems, which is harder to do. You know, how do we, if we're losing, if the sink is failing in the ocean, that's a huge, it causes a huge increase in greenhouse gases. And we need to somehow capture these numbers or the emissions from wildfires that are burning across Canada and other places, for example. You know, we need to capture those numbers in order to understand the, the whole picture. So this is a, this climate trace is perfect for anthropogenic sources. And we need to expand it to aerosols and also to carbon sinks and sources so that we can get the whole overall carbon balance between the sinks and sources, et cetera. Thanks for that, Paul. Just for the uninitiated or as a refresher, could you just give a brief primer of aerosols? Yeah, so the aerosols are emitted by industrial processes, but there's also natural processes and they're non-water materials in the atmosphere. So from a fire, we all know about the smoke and ash and all the different pollutants that go up and the particulates that then can be transported large distance and land on, on the polar ice, for example, darkening it, increasing the amount of absorption of sunlight and increasing melting rates. But there's lots of these particulates that are emitted even from forests, they act as cloud seeding, cloud condensation nuclei to precipitate rainfall. So these aerosols from shipping, the diesel, the type of fuels that are burned in commercial ships, fuels out of their smokestacks, goes up into the atmosphere, actually can block some of the sunlight and cause a localized cooling. But these pollutants kill millions of people per year. There's like 10 million people that die from air pollution per year. So they're trying to clean up have better scrubbers on smokestacks to take out these particles, have less sulfur in ship fuels. But if they do it too quickly, they're removing this blanket, if you like, over the earth, and we can get temperature spikes as a result. And this is a very large effect. It's not an insignificant effect. There's a lot more details that have come out in James Hansen's paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline. I'd recommend people that use that to learn more about what the aerosols are doing, because he, he talks about it in great depth. Well, thank you so much for that. That's really, really helpful. And I think that we should definitely provide a link to Hansen's paper to this video. We did discuss it. And if you haven't seen the video that we did on the paper that Paul just mentioned, we'll link that video in the description as well, because it's really great to go back and see that video. Uh, there's a lot discussed there. I do want to point out that 26% of greenhouse gas emissions are from the generation of energy, and this includes all fuel sources, coal, natural gas, fuel, oil, diesel, biomass. So it's really important. It's a very small thing. You might say, well, that's not going to help any, but it's very important to uh, use as little energy as possible. I know that with the pandemic, one of the things that I've been doing is just leaving the lights off in my apartment and opening the windows and getting the light from outside, from the sun, it's free. And every little bit helps. So please, please try not to buy into this notion that we're doomed, there's nothing I can do. Yes, we're in deep, deep trouble and we can do everything that we can and we should. And I'm gonna turn it over to Peter for more of his thoughts. Yeah, thanks because um... I really want to underline what a powerful, amazing tool this is. 
So I'm going to repeat myself, but that's fine. So you can hone in on each of the three greenhouse gases. You can do CO2, you can do methane, and you can do nitrous oxide, which actually the nitrous oxide map is truly amazing and impressive. So, for example, you can find out with respect to the oil and gas industry, you can find out who's the worst emitter. Well, it's no surprise that the uh, trace shows us that number one is the United States, the Permian Shale, Texas. Number two is Russia. I didn't have time to see what that was. But you hit on a blob on the trace map, and then it zooms in and shows you, ah, this is the Permian in Texas, and it emits so much CO2e. And number three in the world on the oil, gas, CO2 emissions, of course, is Marcellus Shale, which is a vast area just below the Great Lakes there. So this also tells us that the United States is the number one world, e the world leader, the number one in the world for life ending fracking, as I would call it, in both emissions of methane and CO2. Both of those top two greenhouse gases, the US is number one. Now, we hear a lot of numbers, uh, of course, you know, that get quoted, but this, this is a tool which we can say, well, we have the evidence now, you see, it's in there. Um, uh, and it's verifiable that uh, these are the horrible levels of emissions. So I just, want, I just want to give you an example of what a surprise you can get. I live in British Columbia and our sort of big oil and gas play, as they call it, um, is way up in the northeast of British Columbia that nobody knows very much about. It's called the Montney Shale Play of Natural Gas. Well, guess what? I noticed this blob on, uh, on the trace engine here, and I honed in on it. And yes, it says it's Montney, BC, Canada. And it's emitting a vast amount of methane because I had pressed the methane tab. So I was looking at methane. So uh, imagine um, my um, uh, amazement to find that the Montney um, methane is number 35 in the world. So that means it's absolutely huge as an emitter of methane on this uh, vast shale operation. So we can get an idea of scale as well. And then when you look at the whole map, you get an idea of the scale that pretty everywhere we have these industrial projects which are emitting, constantly emitting, every second, every day, these heat-trapping, future-destroying, planet-wrecking greenhouse gases. So thank you, Trace. I agree. Many, many thanks to Trace. Thank you so much, Peter, for naming it rightly. The Marcella Shale and Permian, these are emitting deadly, deadly emissions. And also, as Paul mentioned, and as the World Health Organization also states, around 10 million people die every year because of the very air that we breathe is polluted by these industries. Can you imagine 10 million people and it's Barely a whisper has heard about it. It really is frightening. So, Paul, do you want to close us out? Yeah. So, yeah, I have to just give, give another plug for Climate Trace. It's an excellent utility. And what it does is excellent. I've just been making a few suggestions as, as to you know, how it can be made even more useful by some additions. So, you know, Climate Trace is clearly, uh, it focuses on point sources of emissions. You can zoom in at a point on the Earth and look at a power what a power plant is emitting, you know, what a city is emitting, things like that. So point sources of emissions. But one of the big dangers that I've mentioned is that feedbacks in the climate system mean that we're getting more and more emissions coming from Earth systems itself, for example, from the, you know, less carbon being captured by forests if we're cutting them down or if they're lost to wildfire. So wildfires are especially bad because not only do we destroy the carbon sink, and reduce the amount of carbon captured, but we release all the carbon embodied in the trees themselves. They literally go up in smoke. 
So a lot of these emissions from Earth systems, whether it be from wetlands or less of a sink in the oceans or widespread forest fires emitting, they're, they're more distributed sources. Okay, they're not point sources. So you can't like focus in on one point in the ocean and say, okay, there's less carbon being absorbed there, right? It's more of a distributed thing across a large area of the ocean. So I think it's worth some thought going into this site to try to figure out how to represent these distributed sources and try, how to try to get a number or an estimate on how, on the magnitude of them, because that's what's ultimately important to the Earth the earth system, you know, the energy imbalance and so on, the, the root causes of, of the climate change that we're seeing, you know, and also the aerosols are very important because computer models are, don't do a very good job on looking at the aerosol effects on climate because there's direct effects and there's indirect effects. The direct effects are it's blocking some sunlight, so it causes a cooling on the surface while they're there. They get washed out of the sky very quickly. If the sources disappear, they're washed out of the sky in you know, a week or so from rainfall. So there's a lot of things that are happening in real time, if you like. So if, if th some of those things could be incorporated, that would be very useful. Like when a big volcano goes off, you know, it can cause a, a whole overall climate cooling. You know, there are individual sites that look at all these things, but I think at least if links are there on climate trace, the more metrics we have on all these processes, the better we can try to figure out what is going on and how large the changes will be. Yeah, so that's some, an idea, you know, to maybe incorporate. I know, like, I can go to waqi.org, which is World Air Quality index analysis and you can see the worst air quality places around the world and again that's a point source those are point source data because they have an air quality monitor you know at a couple places in a city for example usually one at the airport maybe one downtown and you can see what the particulate matter is on a point source and then you could use ai similar to what climate trace does to sort of interpolate between the points and get an overall picture, which is what they do on the individual air quality sites. But again, that's another way of looking at aerosols because, you know, the PM 2.5 particles are very deadly for human health. So the site is excellent. Climate Trace does an excellent job. I just think that I hope they don't stop at where they are. I hope they continue to add things to it, such as I've been suggesting. Thank you, Paul. I think those are great suggestions. I also, with the both of you, agree that Climate Trace is incredible. Climate Trace is a rich resource. It's wonderful for people who just like to learn for the sake of learning. It's a great research tool and it can certainly be improved upon. And anything that they do is going to be improving upon something that is already fantastic. So we have like a lot of uh, whistleblowers and people worried about AI. I certainly understand that. But here's a situation in which it can really, really help us. And one way that you can help us is by liking this video, sharing it, and subscribing if you haven't. And ring that bell so that the next time we produce a show, you'll be the first to know. It's been a pleasure meeting with you, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next Climate Emergency Forum.